this uh, knowledge sharing session with uh, uh, Dr. Patrinas and Dr. Bassett. And we are fortunate that they swing by yes, to share their expertise with us after the sessions with the EDCOM. And uh, I, uh, I think that's all I have to say for them. <laughs> And uh, so that we can use, uh, we, it was supposed to be knowledge sharing, but I, I think it's much more better for us to let them uh, uh, do the most of the talking so we can share more, bit, given the little time that uh, we had because they had an appointment at 3 o'clock. Thanks for coming. And I think you should, uh, I'll use my powers to order you to sit in front, not sit at the back. <laughs> Ah, uh, please, please. Do I have to read your profiles? Maybe not, not much. <laughs> Was sent to them, so maybe I, I should not. Harry, you can uh, on and and but I thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to to uh, to be here. Um, looking forward to uh, to sharing um, what what we what we know about the uh, the, the pandemic, COVID nineteen, and the the impact on um, on schooling. Do do I have a clicker? You can just just say next. next next okay. Who's running the slides? Okay. Oh. Okay. Someone just see the next slide. Someone. Next, please. So we know a lot about um, the impacts of uh, various crises uh, and what they mean for for uh, for schooling when they uh when they um impact education in terms of uh closing schools we have um, evidence from from conflicts and wars um uh, teacher strikes uh pandemics that have uh, occurred uh and whenever we have school closures there is a, an impact on uh on learning an impact on uh, attendance mm -hmm. and some of these effects may last for a long time Next, please. Um, the the uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic, which I guess we're still um, still going through, but uh, at it, at its height, led to school closures uh, throughout the world. I think in um, at the height of it, by 2020, 2021, um, most countries had closed their schools for at least a few weeks in all cases, and at one point, more than one point five billion. Uh, children and, and young people were were affected by the uh, by the closures, um, and this map shows the the intensity of the uh, of the closures and and their depth across uh, the world. Next, please. So, two kinds of um, impacts that one can talk about. One is the the educational loss. Um, you could look at the the months or years of, of schooling that are lost or the learning uh, loss in terms of um, cognitive uh, achievement is measured by by tests uh, and the like and the other is more long term but um, if if people do lose uh, schooling or or learning they have less human capital uh, they should also expect to see a decline in future uh, in future earnings we know that every year of schooling raises uh, earnings by about 10% per year. So if uh, schooling has been reduced, then there should be some kind of uh, earnings penalty. Uh, we don't know yet uh, the full extent of the earnings or labor market impacts. Uh, we, can, we can project some of that, uh, but we do now have actual evidence on uh, learning uh, losses because many countries have 
tested their their students and we have several international assessments so what i what i'll share is mostly on the impact of school closures on learning losses next please so while schools were closed uh at first people were not uh, so concerned because uh, we have we have mitigation right we have um uh, online education, distance education. In some countries, they even brought uh, radio in, television broadcasts and the like. Uh, but some some countries had very long school closures uh, and the capacity to deliver education programs quite limited in some countries. They weren't prepared for the school closures. Um, in many countries, connectivity uh, was not perfect internet penetration and the like. So uh, the ability to, to follow lessons online was limited in many countries. And when the, the lessons were broadcast, uh, it limited any uh, ability for students and teachers to, uh, to interact. And the longer the closures um, uh, went on, uh, more reports of uh, poor attendance by uh, by students and by the end people were just not not showing up at all next please so the press was concerned about uh, learning losses uh, most uh, of the national press at least in the united states uh, talked about the uh, the cost of uh, school closures and especially the the learning loss they called it a crisis um, they lamented the uh, the closures next please but not everyone um some people immediately uh talked about the the crisis as it being a hoax and that then that there is no such thing as learning loss uh students are resilient there's online learning so we shouldn't worry so much next please the these are two headlines from the same um, news outlet. One talked about a, a, a huge crisis. The other one said it wasn't um, uh, a big deal. So kind of confused in, in some cases whether whether there was any um, any reason to be uh, to be concerned. Next, please. Uh, my my model uh, of the the learning loss is quite linear. Um, I assume that the more time people spend uh, learning, the more they will learn. And therefore, um, the less time you spend learning, the less uh, you will learn. So we expect that uh, the longer schools were closed, uh, there should be some learning loss. And I assume that uh, any, any mitigation efforts like online education uh, will be uh, less than perfect. So the longer you're out of school, uh, the less the less learning will take place. Next, please. But why why should we expect uh, a learning loss? Um, if you think about it, there really are only two uh, inputs uh, in the learning process: uh, schools and family. We can't do much about innate ability, so we'll leave that out for now. Uh, but when schools close, you're missing. Uh, a major part of the uh, of the uh, learning input. So people learn because they're in class, you have peer effects, you have uh, homework, you have uh, interactions with teachers. Uh, all that is gone because of the school closures. That leaves family uh, inputs. And that is quite inequitable. Some families can support um, their their child's education. They could Teach them in many in in many countries. Families were um, uh, making up for the the schooling loss by getting together in the U.S. They did these learning pods and the like. So, um, if you take out the school, the great equalizer, uh, then you're left with a very um, uh, inequitable input to learning uh, the family. So. <laughs> this simple model suggests that the uh, school closures will uh, reduce learning, uh, but also that it will be quite um, inequitable. Some people will lose more. Who would lose more? People from 
poor backgrounds with less family resources. Next, please. And in fact, now we do have many, many studies uh, showing the, the impact of, of learning losses. There are at least three uh, uh, reviews of the literature and systematic reviews. Uh, picking those studies where you have um, uh, a before and an after, right? So think of the pandemic as a, as a natural uh, experiment. Uh, schooling was going on and, and you have an exogenous event, a pandemic that nobody could predict. And then that uh, forces schools to close. Uh, and most of these studies have found quite large uh, learning losses, 0.12 to 0.25 standard deviations. So a half to a full year of schooling uh, loss um, in, in terms of learning outputs, right? So you're a half to a, 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 a full year full grade behind where, where you should be. Uh, and most studies show that the losses were, were greater for those students or for those schools uh, associated with lower socioeconomic status. So the, the losses were quite unevenly uh, distributed and learning losses um, when it controlled for uh, students' uh, academic uh, uh, achievement prior to the pandemic, th those students that were struggling uh, ended up doing doing worse. So consistent findings across uh, most of these reviews cover maybe 40, uh, 42 countries. Most of those are in Europe, um, North America, a few Asian countries, um, relatively few uh, middle or low income countries, but the, um, the pattern is quite um, uh, quite consistent. Next, please. So our, our global evidence suggests uh, large uh, learning losses, significant learning losses, uh, quite a bit of inequality, the distribution, and uh, we're getting evidence that the, the, the longer schools were closed, uh, the greater the losses. And the duration suggests that it was uh, the school closures and not the pandemic that led to the losses. And, and I think um, I would emphasize this point that uh, it's school closures, not the pandemic. So it's not that people were um, uh, ill that led to uh, uh, learning losses, the fact that the schools were closed. The pandemic was an exogenous event. The decision to close schools was a, was a policy choice. Maybe not at first, uh, I think in March of 2020, um, most countries decided to close uh, schools because of the pandemic emergency and the um, and the uh, aim was to reduce the spread of the pandemic to um, to reduce the peak of the uh, of the pandemic. But at some point, uh, the duration decision was was a policy choice. Next, please. Uh, this is from our database of national studies that uh, attempted to to measure losses um, again rigorous studies that have a before uh, and an after follow up students or follow up um, uh, similar uh, students over time so same grade over time or uh, the progress uh, from grade to grade it could be primary it could be secondary schooling i don't have ecd i don't have higher education so it's mostly basic primary uh, and secondary, and and the the, the losses vary uh, by country quite a bit. Um, far left, I can't uh, Nepal uh, closed for a long uh, a long time. The losses are, are are very high. If you look at the right uh, of the of the distribution, you have one country without a without a bar, um, Sweden. The reason for no losses there, Sweden never closed uh, schools, which makes me. Again, emphasize the point that it's the the school closures and not the pandemic that led to the to the losses. There's other countries with very low um, uh, uh, losses, uh, including uh, France and, and Japan, um, Denmark. Uh, also, uh, though those were countries that did close, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, spring of 2020, uh, they didn't close for very long. Um, in the case of France and um, in the case of Denmark, 
And they did things in addition to the uh, distance education to try to, um, uh, to try to mitigate the losses. But on average, it's about 20 points um, with, with quite a bit of a distribution. Next, please. I mentioned Denmark is one country that had a very low level of, um, of losses. Um, Denmark also measured learning outcomes consistently throughout the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, and in the first year, they noticed that uh, there was a decline in the reading behavior of, uh, 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 of students. And they took action right away. And there's a study that was published um, uh, a few years ago where uh, measuring the impact of the government's approach to supplement the uh, materials that parents were getting, especially for those students that were falling behind. And so they made up for any of those um, early losses. So policy action to... Uh, to mitigate the uh, the early impact of the school closures. And by summer of 2020, um, the equivalent of the, uh, uh, I guess it's called the American Pediatric Association, the equivalent in Europe had published guidelines on how to safely open schools. And most countries in Western Europe opened uh, after the pub publication of those guidelines. And Denmark was one of those. Next, please. Again, Sweden made the decision not to close uh, primary schools. They did close secondary schools, but a study of uh, primary schools showed that before and after the pandemic, there was no impact on uh, learning loss. Again, um, my point that it's the, uh, the school closures, not the pandemic, the, the losses. So if you don't close, you don't see learning losses, it, it suggests. Next, please. Um, two other countries with uh, uh, very low losses, Singapore, um, this became apparent in Singapore's scores on uh, Pearl's grade four reading, and then PISA 15-year-olds, uh, um, they actually improved. So Singapore did something um, to, to address these, or they are so resilient that it made no difference because uh, they did close for a short period of time. I have no idea what the policies were in, in Singapore other than just a great education system. The other country that had no um, learning losses where we have some evidence about why is Uzbekistan. Um, when when the schools closed with, with in Uzbekistan, uh, the Minister of Education decided to broadcast the uh, lessons on television, on their national uh, uh, three national television stations in three languages throughout the country. And the decision to go for broadcast on television rather than internet online education was that the in internet penetration was very low in rural areas. So they didn't want to disadvantage rural areas. So they would uh, record uh, the great teachers uh, each day and broadcast those lessons. Um, we had evidence from a, um, a TIMS-like uh, study in Uzbekistan that was implemented in 2019. They repeated it in 2021, and we found very, very little uh, loss in uh, Uzbekistan. So uh, something about uh, broadcasting the lessons uh, seems to have uh, prevented uh, major learning loss in that country. Next, please. So what we're what we're finding also is that the uh, uh, the rigorous studies are showing that the, the learning loss uh, differs by by status, uh, socioeconomic status. So poor children, uh, those that were uh, struggling more, uh, uh, suffered more. Um, immigrants uh, in in uh, in some countries uh, suffered more. Next, please. A simple linear presentation of the data that we have from the national studies uh, suggests that uh, the longer schools were closed, the greater the losses. It does look like there's clustering. That's mostly European countries. Uh, but even among those countries that look clustered, uh, there is a relationship between duration and, um, and learning losses. Um, we estimate 
uh, with a simple regression that every week of school closure led to a point loss. So meaning that 20 weeks of school closure, you lose about 20 points and that comes close to a school year. Next, please. Yep, uh, 20 weeks of school closures, one year of loss. Next, please. So what else, what else matters? And um, here we tried to, to look at some of the uh, hypotheses that were put forward in terms of the, uh, the losses that were being uh, experienced. Um, some people thought that uh, richer countries could uh, withstand the losses. Um, uh, others suggested the, the higher the school quality, perhaps um, they could uh, be more resilient, uh, internet penetration, the existence of private schools, um, teacher unions. Uh, teacher unions were blamed in some countries for uh, prolonging the school closures. Um, democracy was put forward as a hypothesis. And then COVID itself. Um, and here we measure the impact of COVID with the death rate uh, due to, to COVID. Um, the, the stringency of the lockdowns um, and, and the vaccination rate, because at some point the vaccines were available. Next, please. So when we put all of these factors together, uh, none of them uh, contribute to the uh, estimate of learning losses. The only variable um, that um, uh, that is significant is weeks closed. So uh, on the left, uh, the column one, we simple regression, um, only controlling for weeks closed. Uh, it's about a point per week. When we add all those factors I mentioned, none of them are, are significant, uh, and we get about a point again. So it makes no difference if we control for other factors, including COVID itself. But again, these are this is observational, um, observational data. Uh, it's not causal. Next, please. So we took another step to estimate uh, the school closure duration. Uh, and here um, we found, um, again, from regressions, uh, that um, four things played, uh, five things played a, a role. Uh, the duration was longer uh, in countries that had more private schools. Don't know why. Um, Cynical explanation would be that uh, perhaps leaders in the country uh, educated their own children in private schools and didn't care about public schools. Um, I have no evidence for that. Uh, the higher the quality of schooling, uh, the longer the duration. Um, don't know why that would be, other than perhaps uh, policymakers thought that the system was strong enough to uh, withstand school closures. Um, one factor that uh, that seems to to make sense is the stringency of the lockdowns. So you 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 don't have much choice on schools if uh, the lockdown is quite widespread and uh, being enforced. Uh, I I think that's a more plausible um, uh, factor. Uh, two two things decrease the 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 duration, the income of the country, uh, and the vaccination rate. So the more you vaccinate people, um, the, uh, the, the the shorter the duration of school closures. That one I also think uh, makes a lot of sense. So in order to try to estimate um, more causally the impact of duration, um, we have to instrument um, school closures. And I decided to instrument with the vaccination rate and the stringency index. Vaccination rate during the time of the um, pandemic, this is uh, something that um, uh, it was closely monitored and there's good data. Stringency was also um, uh, measured uh, looking across different uh, uh, segments of uh, society and um, services and, and um, uh, commercial activities and, and just how severe the the lockdown was. So these two variables I used to instrument the uh, school closures. Next, please. When I when I instrument for for um, uh, closures, I get 
uh, pretty much the same result that I got in the uh, simple um, OLS. It is again about a point uh, per week of uh, of school closures, um, uh, all all significant, uh, and the model seems to to behave. So it, it does seem that um, that it's the duration of school closures that matters, and not the the pandemic itself. And uh, just closing. Um, uh, is not the factor it's it's how long you close and again once uh, guidelines were published in in north america and europe um the decision to stay closed was 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 policy it was no no longer um uh exogenous next please so it seems that my um, initial estimate observational estimate that uh uh, every week of, of school closures it leads to uh, about a point loss. And again, 20 weeks of school closures would give you about a year's worth of, uh, uh, of learning loss, which is uh, consistent with the national studies. Next, please. So the implications that, um, that there is truly a, a negative effect of school closures on student achievement seems to be a, a causal uh, estimate. Also, younger students um, and those from families with low socioeconomic status suffered more. Um, all of this, I guess, the the positive spin might be that uh, it it actually confirms that schooling matters. So when you take schooling away from people, learning uh, learning declines, especially for for the poor. So schooling must be doing something. And perhaps that's the one positive lesson we have from the whole experience. Next, please. Uh, so taking these losses of schooling, you might ask, so what um, What does it matter uh, if people are, are, are behind? Um, it will matter a lot if we don't make up for the learning losses because the estimates early in the pandemic is that uh, uh, students will have less human capital and this will affect their earnings uh, going forward. The estimates are 15 to $21 trillion in losses uh, in, in future earnings across all countries of the world. So these are huge losses. It's about 0.8% of GDP uh, annually. So a huge loss of economic productivity and a very uh, inequitable distribution of those losses. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, repeating that um, schooling matters, it builds human capital, and therefore people are at a significant loss, uh, about 10% per year. This is what we use to estimate the uh, the learning losses in terms of future, future earnings. Next, please. The, the losses are huge, 18% of current year GDP, but that comes out to about 0.8% of GDP annually. Next, please. There are other costs of school closures uh, that others have estimated. This is from a JMA uh, article suggesting that in addition to how many people died because of uh, COVID, uh, they are also predicting losses, uh, uh, but years of, of life lost due to less education. Um, the estimate is 5.5 million years of life lost. Uh, because people have less education, given that education is associated with uh, longevity, and therefore less education means people will live um, um, shorter lives. Uh, estimates of mental health uh, uh, disorders uh, have also come out. We're still uh, seeing that evidence. Uh, during the pandemic, the school closures affected uh, uh, child care, uh, which which once once uh, jobs were uh, uh, workplaces were open, that uh, affected people's ability to um, uh, to to work. Uh, affects women disproportionately, uh, and this will contribute to inequality as people women drop out of the labor market. So you're losing not only um, during the pandemic, but then uh, these will have long term impacts if people don't get uh, back to work. Next, please. We have other studies to confirm the, the learning losses. Um, uh, we have evidence from, from PEARLS, 
grade four international test. Uh, there we found quite large losses that confirmed the national studies. I mentioned that uh, younger children uh, suffer greater losses than older students. Perhaps it's much more difficult to, to learn online uh, for, for young children compared to high school students. Um, and we're seeing greater losses for grade four. So the pandemic um, losses for grade four were about a year's worth of schooling. Uh, and again, longer uh, the longer the duration of closures, the greater the losses. Uh, and for students that were already lower achieving, uh, they experienced uh, greater losses. Uh, again, we get a, a, a an estimate of the uh, uh, productivity losses in the case of uh, the PEARLS data, 0.6, eight percentage point reduction in uh, global GDP growth. So similar to the national findings. Next, please. The way we used PEARLS to estimate the, the losses is to take the uh, the trend that we were seeing in past applications of uh, PEARLS um, for all countries and then to, to detrend the analysis and uh, apportion what, what part of this was due to um, uh, the pandemic. And we have uh, weeks of uh, closures estimated by uh, UNESCO. So the uh, blue line is for countries that had um, uh, 10 weeks of closures uh, the red line is 25 weeks of closures, and uh, the greenish line um, has 50 weeks of closures. And along the uh, the bottom are the uh, distributional uh, distribution of, of of students. And you can see um, two things: one, uh, longer the losses, the 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 longer the duration of closures, uh, the bigger the losses, and they they affect those. Uh, poor performers more than uh, high performers. You can you see that especially for the the green line. Uh, the losses are much greater for uh, uh, poor performing students than they are for uh, uh, top performing students. But the losses are there for all groups. It just matters by duration. Next, please. Um, this is the um, the analysis that we did with pearls. The 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 four, four points on, on the top are the trends um, from 2001 to 2016, and, and 2021 is the, um, the analysis that uh, contributes to our estimate of the losses. So you can see that uh, the trend changes considerably with the pandemic, and that's what we're using to estimate the, the losses. So that the departure from the time trend shows us just how large the losses were. Next, please. We also have PISA that came out in uh, December now for 15 year olds, uh, and we do the same analysis. We have PISA for 2018 to 2021, um, um, and we do the detrending analysis again. And, and this shows uh, significant learning losses, but less than in the case of PEARLS, which confirms again the national studies that younger children suffered more. Nevertheless, we get about a 14% of a standard deviation. So that's uh, more than half a year's worth of uh, learning. And with the rich um, covariates and piece that we can also estimate uh, losses for uh, different groups. So duration um, produced greater losses. Boys lost more than girls. Immigrants lost more and uh, disadvantaged students overall uh, experienced greater uh, losses. And again, uh, we estimate uh, income losses, productivity losses that are similar to what we had in PEARLS and the national studies. Next, please. Uh, here, here are the uh, estimates of um, uh, losses by um, uh, duration. Uh, and uh, we're looking at uh, when, when UNESCO collected uh, information on full and partial closures. In some in some countries, uh, the the closures weren't national, and and UNESCO collected this. We also have uh, collected from PISA uh, the reports uh, by students and by principals, and it's pretty consistent that um, 
whoever you ask, whether they're partial or full closures, uh, the the losses are great and they're greater for uh, the longer distribution of uh, longer duration of uh, school closures. So learning losses, again, vary by duration, which suggests, again, it's the school closures, not the pandemic. Next, please. Uh, this is the departure from the trends using PISA. You can see the where the trend was. Um, it's interesting to note also that uh, PISA scores uh, weren't going up prior to the pandemic. And for many countries, except for about five countries, uh, PISA scores were already declining. Um, uh, but we still see a, uh, a portion that's uh, much greater due, due to the uh, pandemic. But some countries did manage to avoid losses altogether. They all come from Asia. Um, I know the Philippines had very little, if any, losses. Uh, um, Singapore actually improved. Korea, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, and I think Taipei uh, also improved. I'm not sure about Macau, but it's only in Asia where we see um, improvements in, in learning outcomes. And it's among the top performing countries. So Singapore has improved prior to the pandemic, during the pandemic. Uh, so strong, strong performer there. Next, please. So what, what do we do about any, any of these um, uh, findings? If, if, we, if we think that um, learning losses are, are important, uh, both uh, for the sake of learning, but also for productivity, uh, we need to recover some of these losses. Fortunately, some of the loss is recovered when schools reopen. There's a very good study in Tamil Nadu, India, showing that um, uh, about a third, if not more, of the losses are recovered when schools reopen. Uh, but still, there's a lot to be made up, and we need learning recovery programs. Uh, we know what um, needs to happen to to recover learning. Students have to get um, direct support when when this is given, uh, whether it's tutoring, uh, extra school uh, hours, summer schools, weekend. Um, it, you're able to to recover some of the, the those losses. Again, going back to Tamil Nadu, that study also had a, a program of direct support to students that fell behind, and they made up another third of the losses. You can't make up all of it. You can make up a lot of the uh, the losses, and that will help uh, prevent um, uh, future uh, learning losses, future earnings losses. Uh, but you can't do much for students that were older and perhaps dropped out and never came back. There's also an absenteeism problem. Uh, well documented in the United States, and we're seeing evidence in other countries. Uh, second response has to be to protect the education budget. In um, 2021, at the height of the pandemic, two thirds of um, World Bank clients uh, reduced uh, education spending. Uh, high income countries increased education spending, uh, but in, in most low and middle income countries, we saw declines in education spending and budgets have not yet recovered in most of those countries. Uh, third, we need to prepare for future shocks. In the health sphere, they have the pandemic fund and they're already thinking about um, uh, avoiding uh, future um, losses in schooling. Uh, I'm not sure that we're that we're we're preparing. I think the, the best preparation would be to uh, to to safely open schools as soon as uh, possible um, and to have the uh, mitigating uh, measures in place. One of the reasons I believe that online education didn't work is that it wasn't uh, prepared. Uh, it wasn't something that we set up to uh, substitute for, for in-person learning. It was really emergency remote teaching. A lot of it was done uh, on the fly. Um, so we, we think we need to think about uh, preparation because there will be other pandemics, other closures. Uh, there's also a huge literature on closures due to natural um, natural disasters, and and probably we'll see more of that in the future. Um, we have a lot of data from many countries. I think PISA has seventy some countries. We collected national studies from forty two countries. 
but there's 200 countries in the world. Um, and for at least half of those, most more than half of those, we have no idea on, uh, on, on whether, the, how much was lost, who lost, uh, very difficult therefore to do anything about it. If you don't know, uh, the scale of the problem, who, who is suffering, uh, so a lot of this is being done in the dark for many countries. So whatever we do, we need to measure learning outcomes. Um, many of the measures that we have, if it isn't PISA and TIMS that were already planned for many countries, uh, there are national studies, uh, assessments that, are, that take place regularly. In other countries, these were uh, test scores from, from research projects. Somebody was doing a, a randomized trial in a country, they happen to have data before they did it during the uh, pandemic. They have data uh, to measure, but um, few national uh, systems are are preparing this. The first studies that were published on learning losses were from the Netherlands and Belgium. These are countries that have uh, large scale student uh, assessments that that take place every year. They continue throughout the pandemic. Uh, without that, pretty hard to to know uh, who who to target. Uh, and to put in place the, the the mitigation and the recovery program. So we need to improve on uh, what we do on, on on assessment and make that available for for teachers and policymakers. I think that's it. Next, please. Thank you. Thanks, Ari. Yeah. Uh... Roberta, do you want to say? Okay, cool. We'll just ask maybe questions <laughs> directly. Right. I mean, um, I don't know, Johnson, if you wanted to speak, but uh, we, we're here today to talk to you about what the World Bank is doing. Harry presented our most recent work on, on learning loss in COVID, and this is a major uh, initiative on the World Bank's uh, side right now in post-COVID recoveries to, to talk about and then implement interventions to support uh, recovery. Right. From my work, I work on higher education. So, you know, as I don't know, no, no, with the profile. So it'd be interesting to hear what you're doing and what your relationship to this work is. Um, we don't have as much data globally on learning losses in the post-secondary sector. So we're talking to institutions more directly about what their experience has been, but we don't have standardized tests. There is no PISA equivalent for higher education globally. Um, so we are here now. You ask questions to Harry, ask questions to me or Jansen or Kartika about the, what the world, the World Bank is doing, because I know it's not always an opportunity that you have to pose questions to us. We usually come in and pose questions to all of you. So hopefully you'll be able to use this opportunity to to learn a little bit about what we do and to ask questions while we're here. Okay, so I, I think uh, maybe we 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 the the institute has been as tagged as the uh, research arm of Edcom, and and so we basically have covered all this from ECD to basic education to Tibet and 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 uh, higher education and even governance and finance and I think uh, we had already a presentations uh, arranged by Jensen on. On ECD, we are trying to have a another one for teacher aid, uh, is because there is. So that's the uh, direct uh, inputs that we got from the bank, and thanks for uh, thanks to Harry and, and Roberta for passing by. And then I think the the question, uh, one of the questions that we we had, there is this research that's being done uh, by the. Group from Ateneo, I don't know, that's the Jesuit school, uh, where they compared uh, the the 2018 and 2020 to uh, uh, PISA scores. Essentially, one of the things that Claude does is that uh, when we compare scores for the lower uh, lower groups quintile, lowest group quintile, we have positive. Uh, increases and negative ones for the higher. That's uh, I don't know how that happened, but uh, but that's that's what what a uh, simple comparison of button uh, of 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 this course. Uh, we were surprised by that. Of course, that we Harry already mentioned that we didn't have much of a learning loss shown in in which is comparing like 
uh, the 2018 PISA was was uh, supposedly pray, and 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 that's that's the other thing. Uh, so I was joke. I was teasing the group that maybe when you're already at, at the bottom, there's nothing lower to go essentially. So that's why we didn't have a learning loss essentially. So that's that's what we how I teach the group about that. But we were there were this. Uh, why was that that the uh, that the lower income class actually increased their scores. That's that's one puzzle that still we're trying to understand. And of course, the other feature of that study was that those who did, who didn't have uh, uh, online devices have a greater so, which basically is also uh, which is easy to understand. Uh, uh, our our uh, one of the results that we by just looking at the mode of delivery in our public school system on the whole education system is that eighty percent of our our public schools are actually on paper modules. Uh, you don't even in Metro Manila. I, we thought it was just an internet question, connectivity question in Metro Manila. That's still the same uh, in public schools. You only see. Uh, higher use of, of uh, online uh, learning in pub, in private schools. Of course, in uh, it's private schools, just 7% of, of, of uh, basic education. So you get a higher proportions of the almost half in the junior and senior high school. But you only see like 30% or towards 40% of private schools using online, but the private school, whether you look at it from from elementary or primary to secondary, uh, it's almost eighty percent on paper. Uh, that's how it was implemented here and paper paper module. It was printed by the teacher, delivered to the students in, on paper. It's a printed module. There's no snow. and I was surprised by the impact on when you mentioned of Uzbekistan's using TV. Here, there's nothing almost. We also uh, because there are, that's one option. Not no nobody. Uh, we have about uh, almost fifty percent of an average, but uh, in terms of TVs in houses. But you you never see uh, any any blip in the use of TV and radio for learning in the Philippines. So it's basically paper and uh, for and, and and some and I think also the other thing that we observe is when there is a little bit more of online learning, there's also large uh, uh, blended blended means both uh, paper and electronic. So that's 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 what happened here in terms of of how uh, education was implemented during the uh, the, the the pandemic. It's mostly it's literally paper. Uh, these modules were delivered by sending uh, emails to the teachers. Teachers were given printers, and, and some of the school given printers and print these modules and delivered to the homes. That's how it's done uh, here. Yeah? So basically, that's how it was done during the pandemic. And and. Uh, that, that that thinks of the process that's what's happened, but then the outcomes we are still trying to understand and trying to tease out what's happening by comparing to 2018 PISA and 2022 PISA. That's all the two highlights that I have said that uh, why we are still why the poor students uh, poor students from poor households have positive uh, in, uh, increase in scores while the ones at the higher, which is contrary to the idea that. The rich are supposed to have uh, electronic access, but the, I don't know. Oh, that that's that's what the so we are still trying to understand that result. Uh, okay, and I, the other thing that I'm arranging with him is the teacher education. Yeah, and so hopefully we can have a session as well, like we did for ECD. Uh, that uh, I don't know. We have a lot if. I don't know if uh, Connie would like to ask Roberta about questions on on on, on higher education. We have lots of problems there. Maybe uh, maybe Harry can. Yeah. 
Thanks for your points. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, interesting for, to hear um, your take on this and, and the experience in in, um, in the Philippines. Just on the uh, the TV in Uzbekistan, uh, I I think this is um, also a, a form of blended because once the the schools reopened, I think they kept some of these TV programs. Uh, uh, so it goes to a sort of new line of research. We're finding that uh, blended learning seems to be quite effective. There's a program in, in China that records uh, great teachers and they send the videos to poor schools. And uh, an evaluation was done there. It, it had led to considerable increase in, in learning outcomes. Also, a, a new paper in the American Economic Review uh, shows that the uh, um, Mexico's telesecundaria program, which are satellite uh, schools in, in remote areas where um, they have one teacher, uh, students in various grades and subjects, but the, the lessons are broadcast uh, by satellite. So it's a kind of blended learning. A again, uh, positive impacts. Also during the pandemic, there were several experiments with uh, online tutoring. Uh, in, in Italy, um, huge impacts on, on, on learning outcomes, uh, 20 points, uh, same thing in Spain. Um, we saw some, some programs in the U S and we're doing this right now in, um, in Ukraine, uh, for displaced uh, populations, uh, even during the war, we're seeing improvements in learning outcomes due to the, uh, the online tutoring. Uh, and we know tutoring is quite effective, but it's also very expensive if it's uh, in person. With online tutoring, it comes at a fraction of the cost, and you get almost the same uh, benefits. And there's also some low-tech uh, experiments that seem to, to work. Uh, just um, sending SMS messages to parents improve learning outcome to some extent. Uh, sending messages with, with, uh, with information about what to do also seems to be quite effective. So those are very low cost uh, uh, programs. Um, on Uzbekistan, uh, I remember speaking to to the minister um, when he when he told me about the, their experience, uh, and he he thought before we did the uh, the second test, he thought that they that, that this this would work, and his reason was that when he went to visit the rural areas, the parents told him. Um, they didn't. They couldn't believe how good the teachers were, in the video. Meaning that what they were experiencing with the live teachers was not as good. So somehow they brought uh, great teachers to these uh, to these villages, and uh, it, it improved people's uh, perception of the system and seems to work in terms of um, uh, learning uh, learning outcomes. So I uh, I think the, the the blended learning has a lot of um, a lot of promise, and perhaps what you were mentioning on um, Combining the the resources and the in person uh, teaching makes makes a difference. I think I think we'll we'll see um, uh, blended learning uh, become a bit more important. I think before the pandemic, it was either or technology or in person. I don't think that's a good comparison. I think it's the the blended learning that will uh, that will that will go a long way um, uh, going forward. Um, on your your results in in the Philippines using PISA, I, I think um, we're also we we also found that for some countries, uh, for for the uh, poorest performing countries on PISA, the losses were greater at the top than at the bottom, and we think it has something to do with the PISA test. It doesn't discriminate very well at the bottom, uh, so I think there, there's probably less movement at the bottom. Uh, than there is at the the top, so perhaps that's part of the reason. Uh, also, I think in countries that may not have full um, enrollment at secondary school, uh, it's not a a representative sample for for those countries. I think if you don't have like eighty plus uh, enrollments at that age fifteen, you're not seeing the the national picture. Um, I think I think national data. Um, would, would would be better for learning losses, especially if it's done just before the pandemic and after. I think the problem with PISA, which is why we had to do that detrending analysis, is that it, it covers a period several years before the pandemic. So 2018, two years before the pandemic, and then uh, then during the pandemic. So um, it could be a country was improving, the pandemic comes, 
they may they may have lost some learning, but uh, overall it still looks like an increase. So it's important to detrend this, and but even more uh, to have assessments that are um, you know national and uh, and yearly to to really uh, find out what's uh, what's happening. And I do think the losses are greater. For younger children, uh, I don't think online is a substitute for for especially for children that that, that don't yet read well. Like hard to follow a, a lesson online. So we do find greater losses with pearls than we do with PISA, which confirms what we get in the national studies. Um, I don't think you can substitute for uh, online for for young children, and maybe it works better at higher levels. Um, but then there isn't much on higher education, as Roberta said. So we need to find out more about this. Um, thank you. Okay. And I had a few few thoughts on on Uzbekistan because I I had the pleasure of working in Uzbekistan. Was the the last uh, specialist working there before the the pandemic. Um, in addition to what Harry said, the the action of the minister was quite timely. So there was no time lost on on speculations, on wondering about what to do. They 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 realized immediately that uh, internet uh, connectivity were extremely low, as Harry said. There is there are three regions, three provinces out of 15 Uzbekistan with very close to zero. There were very close to zero connectivity back in 2019. One, zero, I could say, is Karakal, Pakistan. Um, so quick action, no no sense of well, let's go for internet just because of going because of other countries that are doing that. So we, we cannot do it. And let's do it immediately. That's one point. Another point is that there is a very well established system for in-service training of teachers, a major national institute in the capital and three or four very big institutes in the regions. Uh, immediately, uh, those master teachers of those institutes were tasked with the preparation of the scripted lessons to be broadcasted. And um, and there is a very good, I would say, nicely sense of discipline. So teachers came to record the lessons uh, as, as requested by, by those institutes. So the, the material for the broadcasting was made available quite quickly because of this uh, uh, infrastructure for, for recording and, and broadcasting. Third day it was, uh, thank you. Um, reading the, I don't know if you all, uh, were able to read it. Um, uh, there was this uh, column. Um, uh, which wrote about this this issue of why is it that uh, in the Philippines you see an increase, and to give a different perspective on, on that one, and his hypothesis was, uh, and his hypothesis was that um, it was due to some big policy change that occurred uh, between uh, eighteen and twenty two. The, the, Pizza, pizza, two years, uh, five, well, five years, okay. and 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 that big change has to do with the uh, implementation of the uh, L one, um, uh, the ML was that MTB, MLE, uh, where essentially um, they um, um, the dip ed has already has began to implement the um, use of, um, they call it mother tongue or L1 language you know, uh, for the first three three years, right? And he was presenting data that basically compared uh, the change uh, between uh, uh, this uh, 18 and uh, the, the two pizza uh, years, pizzeries, Years, uh, I'm imitating one of the Edcom uh, member. He was saying pizza yesterday, so I get it off my mind. 
<laughs> and and so he, he found that um I think when you the if the the L1, let's say that was used was it matches uh in English, for example, uh matches the 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 L1, uh it it did not it did not matter much. But where you have a difference, uh uh not speaking English and yet and then you know uh the L1 was different. It went up by 20 percentage points. I mean, uh, points, uh, the scores. The others was basically more or less the same, you know, negative. And and so they were saying, when in, he interpreted it that way, that in fact it was probably can be explained by, or at least as a hypothesis, as thesis, was the implementation of the L1 program. Now, which would kind of, I was kind of um, not too sure about it, but when Babe said, and he let know about this, that they found, a, like for low income groups, uh, an increase. Because where you're going to have the difference in L1 and English with the implementation that was his thesis in effect of, of the um, uh, L1. Um, intervention that the, the the one that will benefit most from it are exactly the poor. So I was wondering whether, but it was just a kind of kind of a, 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 what do you call this two way table essentially, you know, maybe a more uh, rigorous uh, sort of analysis could could throw light on that and. You know the the this thing this controversy this is controversy about the the effectiveness of the current law, and some people want to kind of revise it uh, drastically. And so what he was pointing out, in fact, was we are already seeing the effect of this this law, even though the implementation of the law, even though it may be, you know, uh, not perfectly uh, implemented. Does the language uh, policy affect older kids or is it young no. kids? Yeah. Yes, young, younger kids. Younger kids. Uh, 15-year-olds. Yeah, yeah. That's that. So it does not mean that, right? What, um, I think what he's wanting to also convey is that the, the, the students who took PISA, right, are the ones who bear benefiting from the language policy when it was rolled out, right? So they did learn in their mother tongue in the early years. And so in the later years, they are performing also better. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's, I, I just wanted to add one more point here based on experience from South Asia, right? So again, in South Asia, in many countries, they were providing supplemental learning materials, printed learning materials to the, to the students, right? And mostly that is what was taking place in nearly all the countries. But what we also noticed was they were these NGO CSOs who were providing additional support. And they were really focusing on the most disadvantaged students, right? So I do not know here um, what, what the situation maybe or would have been, but that's something important to also consider, right? There are other programs apart from the ones that the, the schools were providing, but there were additional programs that were also being provided by NGOs who were really focusing on the poorest, right? So just wanted to add, yeah, thanks. We're having right now is to how to do the remedials, uh, like, uh... Uh, the, the government has been doing this uh, cuts up Fridays. Uh, they, they had a summer program, but the summer the problem of uh, uh, my at least my is that it's, it's it's a voluntary program, and we said that when we look at the PISA, if if seventy five percent of your students are below level two, then that's 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 not a a a 
that requires a massive remedial for this. Almost all of your students are not doing their, that, that's, that's what I'm saying. But what we are doing are uh, voluntary programs, meaning if you want to attend, you can attend and discuss a Friday is also that. And so the idea, the question is, how do you like, there's like, just I just came from Congress this morning saying that uh, maybe we just, just forget about the curriculum and just uh, first six months, we just make sure that that uh, they will learn what they are supposed to learn at, the, at this level. And that's just one question, is that the, the idea? So uh, there is this uh, question of how do we do the remedials? Uh, before, uh, in 2018, you already know that uh, 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 almost 80% of our students are uh, below level two. So uh, if we don't do in, anything massive there, we will, we will be carrying that forward essentially. So, so that's that's the so helping our policymakers decide on how to do the remedial is a very important. Besides, of course, the impact of the pandemic. So this, there's a basic problem already in there. So that's one question that we're trying to answer. Um, I think you're right that um, it, it has to be uh, meeting the students where where they are. So I think the other lesson of the the pandemic is. Uh, what kinds of programs work uh, for recovery are the same kinds of programs that work for low achievement. So teaching at the right level makes sense. People have, you know, forgotten what what they learned before, or they was for foregone learning. Right. So you've got a lot to to make up, and and because learning is is cumulative, right? I I can only do this year's curriculum because I learned last year's. If you don't if you miss out all that and you forgot some stuff, you can't do it. So uh, the distribution of the classroom has changed, right? The, there's a much wider distribution. So, some students have actually improved, very few, but some have improved. Others are very far behind. So getting uh, doing the same thing for all of them is not going to work. So teach at the right level, meet them where they are, um, more structured uh, instruction for, for students, that, that, that seems to work. Um, and getting... Um, parents involved. Um, it's controversial in the United States for some reason, but um, we, we, we see that the programs that involve parents seem seem to help. Uh, France and Denmark reduced a lot of the learning loss during the pandemic because they tested continuously and then they sent materials to parents to help them with the online uh, education. So parents have to be part of this. Uh, rich parents don't need the support. They got together, they figured all this out uh, and supported their children. But uh, for for parents that lack the resources and knowledge, I think they need to be uh, supported more. And those things work before the pandemic, so it's nothing new. But I think now we have a urgency to address those uh, those segments of the population. Um, I, I think there is a, a, a body of evidence out there on what to do and what works well for for uh, learning learning recovery. There are very large um, educational programs uh, implemented in, in countries. I, I'll name if, uh, some countries here, Brazil, Colombia, uh, many African countries here in Asia, Cambodia, uh, Timor-Leste, um, Bangladesh. Um, so th those, those, those programs are, are, are called uh, learning acceleration programs. So the, the 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 core of those programs is there is a, a condensed curriculum uh, for students who are overaged. So let's say they are attending grades, uh, students are uh, eight year olds, or attending grades for six year olds, ten year olds attending grades uh, that that should be for eight year olds. So the, the age grade distortion issue. So those programs they have a condensed curriculum. Uh, there is a, a set of teachers uh, well trained, well prepared to deliver the condensed curricula in a in a in a, a, a short period of time. There are assessments to be to be conducted by teachers on a very regular basis to measure the the incremental uh, learning that students are getting. So, 
students are expected to complete the learning acceleration in a certain period of time, but given the constant assessments, teachers can can recommend the, the exit of the programs for those who already got to the expected level. That, and again, there is uh, a reliable and, and a large a large board of evidence of there uh, for, for, for governments to build on. So there's no no need to start from scratch. Uh, uh, some questions, uh, maybe insights or questions on your presentation, Harry. Um, there are two things. One is on the, what struck me the most was the, uh, your um, insights on Uzbekistan and Singapore. And I was just wondering if, uh, to begin with, Singapore already has very good initial conditions, uh, meaning they have good endowments. And so when no amount of school closure, or at least the school closure did not really matter to them as much as the school closure uh, that had occurred here in the Philippines. So I was just wondering if that is something that that uh, was controlled in all of your um, um, estimations. That's one. And then the second thing is the... Your uh, you were mentioning something about the boys having bigger learning losses, and um, I, I was thinking when you were saying that that um, does this underscore differentiated learning, and that does this mean that we need to have differentiated strategies across gender? Thank you. Um, the the analysis we did with uh, Pisa and Pearls. Uh, did control for for all the the characteristics that are in the the, the data sets. Pieces is much uh, stronger and covariates than than pearls, but we did we did control for that. In fact, we need all of that in order to create the trends. So um, whatever characteristics are measured in in um, in, in pizza, we, we uh, or pearls, we we do control for those. It doesn't get at um, good policy making, right? I mean, there's no questionnaire and piece uh, on um, how good a country is on, on policy. So that that part is what we're inferring that, you know, uh, countries like, like uh, by default, countries like Singapore do. Um, but there is no independent study that I know of that really measures what happened during the the, uh, the pandemic in Singapore. They, they closed relatively short period of time, uh, but somehow students improved. So whatever they did, I think we need to find out and implement this everywhere. But uh, what's worrying about the uh, COVID aside, uh, even before the pandemic, I, I followed the the top performers in Europe and the top performers in in East Asia, uh, and the decline uh, occurred before the pandemic in Europe. So that the top performers, except for Estonia, uh, were declining before the pandemic. So Finland. Uh, this was the, if you remember the the country that everybody is supposed to emulate, they they lost more than most countries in Europe, and they were already declining. They were number one in two thousand in reading. Um, they're no no longer top ten in uh, in reading as, as far as I remember. They've been surpassed by uh, Poland and Portugal. Uh, but all the top performers in in Europe have declined. Uh, and the top performers in East Asia have improved in not just in PISA, those that did pearls, and uh, we saw that pre-pandemic, Tim's 2019, those same countries are, are improving. So there's something fundamentally different in, in uh, East Asia on, 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 on their policies that, that's, um, that's resistant to, to change that, uh, that we're getting, or even pandemics. Um, so I, I don't know how else to control for the strength of these systems, but I think it does show that you know, the, what we're not observing is is the policy making, and that seems to be what what makes the difference in these um, in these countries. Uh, on your point about the the boys learning more, this is something we get in PISA, not in Pearls. Uh, in Pearls, there were no gender differences on losses, but in in PISA, boys lost more. Um, we don't have evidence on um, you know uh, absenteeism during the, uh, the the pandemic, because we know in, in many countries, especially in the United States, the longer the, the schools were closed, 
people started uh, not not coming, and I think it's boys that uh, probably um, uh, started more. So maybe that's part of it, but we can't control for that in PISA. Um, I, I I do think there's a need for differentiated teaching. Um, I don't know if if it's uh, uh, for 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 boys and girls, but definitely for for people that that fell behind, something else needs to happen. And I think it goes to, you know, again to education policy. How do we deal with poor performance? Children are retained, and they do the same the same year all over again, the same teaching, right? So, and then they fail again. So, like, we can't keep doing the same thing. It doesn't work. So, we do need to to figure out. Uh, better approaches for uh, uh, for for learning uh, for people that are that are falling behind. So differentiated teaching, teach at the right level, all of that I think make makes a lot of sense. And we're learning a bit more about uh, why that's important with the pandemic. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, Harry. Um, my question um, is on the definition of learning because um, you've um, presented that you've used pearls, PISA. Um, I wonder if you're only dealing with the academic learning. Um, probably other teams in World Bank is um, tackling the behavioral interpersonal skills that was lost during the pandemic. So that's one question. And another is um the, the 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 term is learning loss. My question is is it 100% recoverable? Should countries um target 100% recovery from from this loss or probably what is the optimal level that is plausible to be recovered in in the immediate in the immediate term? So I, I guess if, if we really want to advocate for increased government investments to, to address this problem, we, we need um, the policymakers to understand that we, we have to do um, interventions now. So we, we have to um, probably give them um, scenarios, what will happen if we don't do anything in the first three years, in the next five years, because you've already um, presented the long-term impact, and that's striking. But probably each country would um, take it more seriously if at their um, um, level, they would be able to really plan, oh, for this year, we need this much um, investment to recover 30% of what was lost or so something like that. So... Those are some of my thoughts. Yeah, great questions. Thank you. Harry, I just have a, a short follow-up um, related to that. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, the importance of having uh, budgets for education, raising them. But then if you look at um, education spending, uh, like Philippines and Vietnam, for example, spending on education is quite uh, different, pretty small, like a few hundred uh, dollars. Uh, but then the, the, the difference in PISA scores about 100 Point. So I wonder what are these countries doing that we're not doing? How could we be more effective, efficient, and using our resources? Okay, great, great questions. Um, let me let me start with the first one on on the um, other kinds of losses, uh, behavior, social, emotional health. Uh, that 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 evidence is starting to to come in. A, a book just got published from um, in in the U.S. on on. Uh, the American experience, the tremendous uh, mental health uh, losses, and uh, we don't have as much of that in in, in our countries, but uh, I'm sure it's coming. But I, I don't know of a, of a specific one. Maybe colleagues do. Um, on the recovery, um, I don't think it's 100%. Uh, I don't think it's possible to get 100% for for two reasons. One, some kids have left the system. I mean, PISA's 15-year-olds. In, in most countries, compulsory schooling goes up to maybe 16. If you were already at risk, you don't like school, and now you know it's been closed for a year, and now you're behind, how much longer are you going to stay uh, in that system? And, and I'm not sure we're going to get those, those kids back. So we've already lost them from the system. 
for grade four, Pete Pearl's uh, data, you know, I think a lot of that can be recovered because they're still in school and they're still there. But it won't be recovered if we keep doing the same the same thing, right? And um, uh, we we talk like we know um, that there are specific interventions we can do that will help you recover a lot of that. And we have some evidence that shows that. But what I'm hearing from policymakers is, uh, why, why are you talking about learning loss? We open schools, the pandemic's over. So the the assumption is, you know, schools were, you know, schools were open in the past, everything was fine, it wasn't, but it's, it's school closures come, it's a crisis, now they're open. Stop talking about learning loss. Uh, we're 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 back to normal. So they they're they're not um, they're not worried. The other thing I hear, I was at a conference in um, in Lisbon a couple of weeks ago. Um, some policymakers are 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 saying things like, um, "It's not our fault that learning losses went down. It's the pandemic." So it's it can't be both, right? So when the 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 pandemic uh, started, and they said, "Well," don't worry about school closures because we have online education. Well, that didn't work. So now they blame it on the pandemic. So I'm not getting the sense of urgency from policymakers, to be honest. Um, uh, and it's and it seems to be worldwide. Uh, people have lost interest in this. Uh, there more. There's more and more uh, either ignoring it, um, blaming you for for bringing it up, or you know it wasn't that big a deal. So. I don't see that urgency, and I don't think that people feel the losses, right? If if it's a, a health issue, you can see it. You can see the, the people suffering. You can see the data. If we're talking about people losing earnings, you know, you're 15 years old. You're not entering the labor market for, for a while, and, and those losses are only going to accumulate over a very long period of time. Uh, that's going to be several measures of finance into the future. Uh, so they're not going to see this uh, uh, this this cost. So hard to to plan if you deny um, there's losses. And like I said, most countries never measure them, so you can't even point to uh, to losses, right? So I, I'm not so optimistic that um, they're going to do a, a lot about this. I think it it needs to be uh, continuously uh, hammered in. I agree. Um, we need to show where 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 the benefits will come, and I think we do need to get more um, voices into this. Uh, the, just before the pandemic, it's it's um, um, coincidental, but uh, there was a a study published, in one of the major economics journals. I can't remember which one, on the impact of the nineteen eighteen flu uh, pandemic. Uh, so we're talking generations after the pandemic, you can still find uh, impacts on people's health and um, uh, socio-emotional well-being, earnings it, about a, a pandemic from um, 100 years ago. And we have evidence also being published uh, uh, recently on the Great Recession and where school spending in in districts in the U.S. had declined, they're still seeing impacts on on the school systems today. So you know more than a, I guess a, more than a decade later, right? So we have this this evidence, um, but it doesn't seem to be people aren't connecting this. So I think uh, I, I think you're right that we we could make more of this, but we're 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 just not getting the voice of the the policymaker on this you know it it um it was a, a health epidemic obviously and that was the priority action so we thought well maybe we'll we'll turn to education once the uh the health part uh, uh degrees no then it was an employment issue because people had lost jobs we need to focus on uh labor markets then it was um energy crisis because winter came and um then there's the wars uh so education never got its um uh, kind of you know moment in in the uh the limelight so uh i hate to be pessimistic but we're just not see hearing the the demand for this um on on um 
on spending, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I was looking at um, some of the numbers. We talked about teach at the right level, structured pedagogy, and the like. Um, teach at the right level uh, from, from rigorous studies, uh, randomized trials, suggest you get learning gains of, I don't know, let's say 80 points uh, for something like $26 per student, which sounds great, great bargain. Average spending low-income country is $54. I don't know where they're going to get the $26 from. So you're right. How, how do you, how do you uh, even use these low-cost uh, programs if your budget is you know, $50 per student? Central African Republic, $17 per student. So it's le you know less less than what these uh, uh, interventions will cost, and the the average spending fifty four dollars compared to high income countries eight thousand dollars per student, but we hold them to the same the same part. I mean the SDGs apply across income levels, right? Across uh, spending levels, and we're expecting learning uh, gains for fifty dollars that 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 we don't even see in some of those high income countries. Uh, high income countries spending on education has increased since since the pandemic. It's increased in low income countries, but from fifty dollars to fifty four dollars. That's the and it's great, but it's not nearly enough to uh, to reach an adequate level of spending. So we know what's cost effective, but I don't think we have uh, the budget. So there is a need to spend more. Um, we, we worry about inefficiency of spending, but there has to be an adequate level, some minimum level. And, and that's uh, something we need to, to establish. And hopefully some of this, uh, these best buys will help us establish what those, uh, what those spending levels are. But, uh, but you're also right. There are countries that with um, uh, similar spending levels are achieving uh, much greater results. Uh, Vietnam's been well studied, as you said. We know that uh, the efficiency there is quite high. The, um, there's a comparison using the um, Young Lives uh, data with, that compares several countries uh, with similar data, and uh, the efficiency of uh, of a dollar spent in in um, uh, Vietnam is like uh, several times more effective in terms of education outcomes in. in in Peru or, or other countries that they measure in young lives. So something about the efficiency of spending and and lack of waste wastefulness. So we're, we do have some some indicators of, of how you can make spending a bit more efficient. If you focus on on the learner, if you uh, assess, if you if you hire good teachers for uh, the school system. I mean, the, what those five. Um, Asian countries, East Asian countries that improved in PISA and TIMS and, and, and everything else have in common is that teaching is a profession that's hard to get into, very selective, only the best are accepted. And then not everyone graduates to become a teacher. Uh, so they're only getting the best people into teaching. And since most of your spending on education is teachers, it makes, it goes a long way. So that's something that, um, uh, we need to think about as well teaching policy, not just training teachers, but also selecting the best into the profession. Um, I'm just going to add one point because something that Harry posted on his presentation, which I think is relevant to these questions too, when schools close, he had the table that showed when schools, he X'd out the schools and said the family inputs were all that was left, right? how much the social order, social commitment to education, family commitment to education varies country to country as a social construct too. Uh, it still impacts, right? It's not just whether the money's being spent well, it's also what is the entire social environment around learning for students and that actually plays a huge role still. So you could spend the same amount of money and have a different kind of social commitment to what the education expectations are for your child. We have heard in some countries even here, some skepticism around the findings. Well, you know, if the parents are happy with the learning, does it matter if they have, or if they're in learning poverty, right? Because they think it's good enough. I mean, good enough can stymie growth and really utilization of your education environment efficiently. So, you know, I'm not speaking to the Philippines. I don't know what the social expectations are around education, but they do vary quite widely worldwide. And that can have a huge role 
which they saw, which you saw during the pandemic, right? Yeah. Um, well, in, in, in the Philippines, you, you find that um, uh, people, when they rate the satisfaction rating, it's very high. So, but of course, the reality, when you look at the data, it's different. And so the question is why? Why the cognitive dissonance, as I would like to call it? And um, some are saying that maybe um, the the uh, this lack of information. Uh, so th that is something that is worth doing because what it means is that uh, at least for the public education sector, there's no political accountability. For performance, because the thing is fine, right? Uh, and then, on uh, on the other hand, um, you don't have the in the in the case of the private sector, they have some incentives. They have a drive because they continue to. If they fail, you don't get the you know they don't survive, they don't flourish, etc. But so it's a very important the political accountability. Of, of schools and their leadership. So, you know, this this dissonance part, uh, you know, need to be understood and, and how to reduce that. Because if you don't get dissatisfaction because you think it's just perfect, it's fine, no problem, then the, mm -hmm. there will be no pressure for the bureaucracy and the politicians to shape up. Mm -hmm. There was an experiment, Dick, in um, North Carolina, um, I think Mecklenburg County, uh, schools were underperforming and they got um, in some states that the, the the exit right so you can get a, a voucher if, if your if your school's been failing for so so long um, and they found that parents were taking their kids out of the failing public schools but they were choosing bad schools in some cases worse schools than the ones because of a lack of information mm -hmm. even though the information was there it was it was published but <clears throat> The experiment was to provide parents with more information uh, about the school. So kind of ranking them. Mm -hmm. These are the schools in your uh, local uh, area. Here's their performance on, I guess, test scores or whatever. And it worked. So can, getting- can, can you pass on the last, the, the, the study? Sure. sure. Uh, I, I would like maybe to, to, to say a few points as, as we close, because we have to, to leave going to the UP. Uh, and I will complement what Herod said about your very excellent question. So we, we, we tend to believe the pandemic is behind us. It is uh, four, four years ago, right? January 24 now. So January 2020 was the first time we heard lockdown, a lockdown for the first time because of the pandemic. Harry mentioned the, the health crisis of uh, 1918. Um, but but a point for us not to forget is uh, schools closed because of other uh, um, issues as well. I, I have one project in Tonga, uh, and, and that project that I that I that I work uh, with uh, on, and it it, it supports the uh, recuperation of schools devastated by a tsunami that hit the country two years ago. So there is there is no school closure. There is no school at all. Uh, Thirty percent of the school network was destroyed by this major tsunami. And so I, I went there to see with my eyes. Uh, there is no school. What they did, they, they moved kids to another schools that are so existing schools are overcrowded. Here in this country, over one million students are attending what what is called the TLS yes. TLS temporary learning space. They are supposed to operate only for two to three months, but they last almost one year. And the TLS are established because of typhoons and quakes. Over 1 million attending those, those TLS. So on, on your point, what is the, the expected or the ideal level of recovery? If it were, if I were, I had to talk for, for my kids and say 100%. I want my kids to recover their learning 100% level the pre-crisis. Pre, pre my daughter graduated from college during the, the pandemic. I'm sure she she's carrying this gap with her through life, action needs to be taken immediately, right? So if you don't take action to recover that learning lost, so students will carry the, the, the knowledge gap with them. 
Uh, and I'm going to get back to the point. There is no need to reinvent the wheel, the wheel right? So learning cover programs, they have been implemented in many, many countries across the globe with success for years and for decades, for decades. So there is, there is a recipe for governments to follow. But if they are implemented without any systematization, like uh, they are not compulsory, the, the Friday catch-ups are for those who want to go. So there is there is little hope, but if if the learning recovery is done properly, uh, following with or certain recipe, they they prove su successful and they can they can recover hundred percent because there is there are, there are the assessments to tell how much learning was recovered. So I think with that we may eventually close. Yeah. That's the only time that we have with these guys, unfortunately. So, you want to close any closing statements before? Uh, just uh, just to say thank you for this opportunity. Good to, good to see you. And and um, if you have if you have more questions or want any of these, uh, I presented from many uh, papers, several of my own. If you want any information, please contact me. And happy to to follow up with you. Thank you. Dad, thank you very much, you. Uh, Roberta. Are you dancing? Artika. Good, good. Joel, okay. uh, for for come coming by and, and sharing what you have, and then I hope it's not the last time that we'll pass by here, uh, and 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 and, and fill us in with, with many issues that we have. You know how our education system is in is, is in is in trouble, and I hope uh, we we need as much help as we can. Thanks Thank you very us. much. Yeah, I know you're uh you have an appointment at three o'clock.